Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Dr. Stephanie Wu, and I am the host of Wu University and the founder of Wu University, and I'm really excited about this exciting, amazing program that we have put together for you. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce two of my very dear friends. I'm so grateful for them to be here tonight. First is Dr. Ryan McKinnis. Dr. McKinnis was trained in Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he graduated magna cum laude. He graduated from a residency in ocular disease at Ohio Eye Alliance in 2011, and then he spent the next nine years as a clinical optometrist at the Cleveland Eye Clinic. It is during this time that Dr. McKinnis became passionate about providing comprehensive eye care to the entire family. He is a former governor of Zone 2 of the Ohio Optometric Association, as well as a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society. In 2019, Dr. McKinnis achieved the title of Diplomate in the Cornea Contact Lens and Refractive Technology section of the AAO. This is one of the highest clinical designations in the field of optometry. He now owns Infinity Eye Care in Ohio. And here's his disclosures for this evening. And then next is Dr. Chris Smiley. Dr. Smiley is a native to the central Ohio area and he is the second generation owner of Vision Professionals. He graduated from the Ohio State University College of Optometry in 2001 with top honors in contact lens patient care. He was honored with the prestigious American Optometric Foundation's Contact Lens Excellence Award. He has served as a clinical investigator for a number of contact lens study programs, which allows him to provide many lens technologies before they are commercially available. He also serves as a consultant to many contact lens manufacturers. Dr. Smiley currently serves as the treasurer of the Ohio State Alumni Association for the College of Optometry. And here are Dr. Smiley's disclosures. And it's my pleasure to welcome not only just two amazing doctors, but they're both such good friends of mine. And I asked them to present this lecture because we had so many comments and feedback from private practice owners or people that were maybe looking into private practice or just learning to market their practice better. Maybe they're in charge of the marketing aspect of their practice. So this is such a highly requested topic I know that you guys are going to learn a ton from them because they both have amazing practices. And uh, I'm, I'm just so thrilled that you guys could be here tonight. All right. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for attending. And it's uh, great to be here and presenting on behalf of Wu University to discuss marketing your optometric practice. Most of us as ODs, you know, wouldn't probably don't think of ourselves as master marketers, which is probably why there's a lot of interest in the topic. And quite frankly, I will tell you that early on in my practice, I found my marketing skills to be pretty weak and that led to me making many mistakes. So just like we have the American Optometric Association, the American Marketing Association has their own group. And we'll start with the definition of marketing. Let me see if I can get this window out of the way here. This will be one of the few slides I actually read to you all, but it's a core for what we're going to talk about today. And what our goal is, is just to have a nice overview of marketing and optometric practice. So hopefully we'll generate a lot of fruitful ideas for you guys on how to get your practice marketing correctly. But first, we'll start off with what marketing is. And, and really, a lot of us will think of marketing as advertising, but advertising is just one form of marketing. Marketing is actually the activity set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, and delivering, exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. So that would be our patients. So we got to think of things that would be of value to them. And we all market every day in our exam chair. So think about a patient that you have that complains of contact lens dryness at the end of the day. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna promote or market a product or a solution for that need that the, your patient has. And that is marketing. Um, marketing is just, again, something that'll meet a patient's needs. And what we wanna do today is not only just market from our exam chair, but learn how to market on a larger level. 
And so the first hot tip I'd have for you is don't overlook the, the power of communication from your exam chair. Um, presenting a new service, learn how to present a new service. Let's say, for example, you want to offer dry eye therapy in your office and you currently don't do that. I think a lot of us tend to stay in our own routines and we don't break out of our ruts, but it's really important to learn new things. And, and by doing that, we can market those to our practice. But that's not really what we're here for today. We're here to really learn how to market our practice on a larger scale. And I'm getting dinged on the slide. So since this is modern marketing, I do want to talk about some key differences between today and yesterday as far as practice and marketing. And, and maybe some of these are marketing and maybe some of them are not. But a lot of patients used to access us by phone calls. And, and now we can communicate with patients via email and text messages, um, making sure we remain HIPAA compliant. And so if you're not able to communicate with patients via text messaging, that's an excellent way to market and promote your services. It also used to be the phone book was a centerpiece of advertising for the practice. And now everything is our World Wide Web web page. Um, word of mouth marketing, if you ask a lot of pra practitioners, how do patients find my practice? They're going to say, well, other patients tell them. But today, the word of mouth is online. And that's where our web reviews and those kinds of things come in. When I started marketing my practice in 2001, one of the big things we worked on was creating a practice brochure. And we still utilize practice brochures, but not so much for our full practice. Our, our web is really the cornerstone of that, what our practice does and what our practice is all about. We use our brochures more for specialty pieces to give patients more information. The other thing is just calling to schedule an appointment. So um, think about if you're going to book a airline trip. Are you going to call American Airlines and sit on hold for 30 minutes? No, you're going to go online and book that. And so scheduling via the World Wide Web and having real-time scheduling capability is key to let your patients access you. Patients used to come and pick up contact lenses in our office all the time. And pre-COVID, one of the changes that we made is, is we started sending contact lenses to patients instead of sending them to office, even if they order less than the annual supply. And what that did during the pandemic was it allowed patients to not go somewhere else because they knew we already provided that service. And there's many other things such digital registration instead of uh, paper registration. Um, one of the things that's big in orthokeratology right now is utilizing telemedicine for the day one follow-up visits. In the future, and this is where we need to think about marketing a little bit is um, instead of doing vision screenings in, per in person, we're now seeing the advent of digital refractions. And what, whether it doesn't matter what your feelings are about those, those are gonna be unique tools to actually help us capture and market our practice to patients and bring patients to us. So before we really start talking about marketing, we really need to look at what our brand is. And, if you want to market eye care, there's a lot of there's a lot of folks that just say, hey, you know, I provide eye exams and those kinds of things. But really think about what stands out and what makes you different. So, you know, marketing eye exams is kind of like marketing to a tank full of similar goldfish. And really what you want to do is you want to be able to stand out. And how do you be, how are you a fish in that goldfish tank that's not gold that really stands out in a good way? And so what makes your practice unique? And I think until you hone in on this, that you're going to find a difficult time marketing your practice because you have to really know who you are. So Dr. McKinnis is a contact lens specialist, and he's really going to hone in on that contact lens specialty. And so identifying your brand is a key component, and we could probably spend a lot of time talking about that in and of itself. And then we really need to look at the strategy, and the strategy is the plan of action that we're going to take to to market our brand and to market our practice. And so kind of the cornerstone of, of marketing your optometry practice in today's age is your physical real estate as well as your web presence. And we might not think of the real estate as the first thing that comes to mind, but since most optometry practices are community-based, our actual location makes a difference. And Dr. McKinnis recently opened a, a private optometric practice, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to him for this part of the presentation. All right, so we, we have a little bit here of, uh, I won't read this whole definition to you though, of, of marketing research, but 
at the end of the day, it's it's basically the study of, of how often and how do you get um, the consumer or your customers or your patients exposed to the information? How often do you have to get them exposed to the information such that it has the desired effect on them? And how do you collect the data necessary so that you know that it is having the desired effect? So uh, in a nutshell, that's the marketing research that we uh, have to attempt to perform and amongst all the other duties that we have. Uh, I know that we as private practice doctors, or at least most of us, probably did not have a whole lot of marketing uh, training nor the background in marketing prior to going to optometry school. Uh, but one thing we are fairly good at is looking at studies and numbers and being very analytical about things. So when it came time to open uh, the practice, which we did just this past January, uh, no time like the middle of a pandemic to pull the trigger on that one, uh, we tried to do it in a very analytical way. And so uh, through uh, the consulting firm, which I had used to start my practice cold, uh, we approached it here with population distributions and distributions of optometrists and then went from there. So, and here's ways you can break it down by population, income, traffic is one that's often overlooked. Um, I can't tell you, I, I quit counting how many times that the marketing is that somebody literally drove by the office and realized there's a new eye doctor in town. And so traffic analysis is important and competition analysis is important as well. Not just the sheer number of, uh, of optometrists and ophthalmologists in the demographic and in your uh, immediate area, but also what type of subspecialties are around. Um, as Chris had mentioned, uh, me being heavily invested in contact lenses, I don't know that I would have opened a practice in a town uh, that already had a well-established contact lens practice. And so these are just four of the uh, buckets that you can uh, sort of look at when it comes to demographics. So when it comes time to collect this information, you can run something called a geospatial analysis. And this is where the rubber meets the road here. And so geospatial analysis uh, is essentially taking all of this data and trying to put it into something digestible. So this was ran last fall for us as we were uh, getting ready to go uh, and, and set up the office there. It gives us a breakdown of the ethnicity in our area that we were looking at, gives us the count of households. Is that uh, town uh, leveling off? Is it growing or is it declining over time? Also tells you household size, household income, total population, and your projected growth. And of course, the hope would be that if the town is growing, that you likewise would be able to grow as well. Next slide there, thank you. Yep, and here is the traffic. Okay, so we lose Dr. McKinnis analysis that I had mentioned. So, still there? Yeah, I think you kind of broke up for me. Did it a break up bit, there? Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, the Northeast Ohio spectrum internet strikes again. So <laughs> <laughs> we're uh, good but, though, we're good. Yeah, we're back. The, but the traffic analysis we showed there shows just sheer number of cars that go by. And here is uh, one that shows eye care opportunity. So it, it just solely breaks it down by zip code and demographics, the um, what's spent the most on eye care. And so it, it allowed us to pinpoint there when we were opening the practice, what is an appropriate area to open one versus perhaps opening one uh, in, in a bit of a down area. So data makes all the difference, not only when you're opening the practice, but then when you're trying to tailor uh, where you're going to market. So I broke it down here into the five W's of marketing. Uh, we already know the five W's from, from way back in grade school English, but the who, what, when, where's, and why's apply to marketing as well. So the who are you marketing to goes back to that geospatial analysis. I want to know what the average household size is and roughly the median income so that I can tailor my marketing so that it appeals to folks uh, in that immediate demographic. Um, if, you have, uh, if you have a town that's made up of significant number of seniors, that is going to look very different than one that's made up of a young up and coming millennial population. And uh, it all goes back to that data gathering at the beginning. 
what are you marketing? And at the core, what we're marketing is yourself. And I find that to be uncomfortable uh, in a lot of ways. Um, it's not something that a lot of us feel comfortable talking about uh, in essentially trying to brag on ourselves and, and, and market what we do well, but that's what we have to do. People don't know what you know, um, especially when you're new to the area. And so what we've attempted to market in my practice is the stories. Um, it's a small office being that we started cold, but my wife works in the practice with me. And so we play up the family centered aspect of our practice. And it's at the center of our website. It's at the center of our practice mission. Uh, we have four kids largely because we're terrible at math. And so with those four kids and the comic relief they provide and the stories that they provide, it's all woven throughout the practice. Uh, we named our practice Infinity Eye Care because my then 10 year old walked in the room and said, just call it Infinity Eye Care. I don't know why this is so hard for you guys. And my wife and I looked at each other and said, that works. It makes for a great story. And so that's literally how we named our practice. And so those are the type of stories that you can market and, and they do pick up traction in some of these areas. When should you market? Of course, is uh, we could do a whole lecture on just this aspect of it. Certainly, you, you can market the special events uh, with a careful eye on cost. And uh, Chris can probably get into this even better than I can, having uh, run a practice with four offices. You do have to watch your costs. But the most important part about when you should market is, frankly, as often as possible <laughs> without annoying the folks you're trying to market to. Uh, th there is a term out there called effective frequency that says how often do you have to market for someone to change their behavior before it becomes uh, detrimental to, to your cause. And depending on the study you look at, it would be somewhere between five and 10 times someone must see your service or your location before it has the opportunity to change a behavior or produce an action. So as far as when you should market, uh, early and often. We could also go into great detail on where you should market. Uh, the world has moved online, and, and that's certainly uh, that's certainly a given. Uh, we know that we don't have much of a choice these days. We pretty much have to market on on uh, things like Google and a lot of these online search engines. Um, I have found that Google marketing is one of those things that has not been wildly effective for us, but the reviews have been. So, you know, you take the good and the bad with it and you just sort of have to grin and bear it and bite the bullet on the cost for some of this stuff. Social media is one that we can do fairly economically and we hit social media fairly hard. Um, periodicals are not something such as papers that you would not expect to have to market. But son of a gun, if most of the seniors that have come into our new practice haven't been because we got a free write up in the local paper. And, and every last one of them cut it out of the paper and brings it with them. So you know, it's one of those things where it was free, it was easy, and son of a gun, if it wasn't the best return on investment we've had. Um, local events, as we mentioned earlier, are, are great opportunities to get out in front of people. And really all you're trying to do is, is twofold. You're trying to plant seeds so that people know you're there. And you're also trying to show people that you're you're committed to the community and the local events. And that goes a long way in a lot of these uh, towns where uh, folks like to support their own. And then of course, lastly, as Chris mentioned, there's no more important one than the patient in front of you. We find this interesting phenomenon as a new practice where it's usually dad gets sacrificed to go try the new practice and see if they survive it, if they like it. And if dad wins, then all of a sudden the wife and the kids and, and the grandparents show up. So there's a whole phenomenon that, that, we've, that we've noticed there where it, it slowly trickles in. And uh, a lot of that is, is because we, we never stopped marketing to the people in front of us, largely by just trying to treat them well and, and treat others how we'd want to be treated. And then lastly, why? I mean, certainly we know we want to market because we want to be successful. We want to be more profitable. At some point, um, you know, my kids are going to become teenagers and I'm going to have to afford the groceries. So we, we, we need the practice to do something. But a large reason why we market, in my mind, is because we elevate the practice and we elevate the view of the practice to others. So me telling somebody that our practice is wonderful only goes so far 
but whenever you can put out specific details of new product offerings and new technology and you have the expertise to back it up, then it becomes, it's almost like an avalanche. People start telling others who tell others and then it becomes something that folks want to experience. So uh, yes, there, the end result is uh, hopefully success, but really at the beginning, it, it, you want this elevated view of your practice in front of the public and, and that's why we should market. All right, <clears throat> thanks, Dr. McKinnis. And uh, let's see that audio is audio switching to me here. Let me see here. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, sounds good. So what we're going to do is, um, Dr. McKinnis gave you the five W's and uh, talked about location. So for those of you that are looking at expanding, starting a new practice, it, it, it's an important part of your marketing strategy. So. You know, Dr. McKinnis is a contact lens specialty practice. And one of the things that uh, one of my classmates did in optometry school is his father was a primary care physician. And he ended up building his optometric practice onto that, that building and they share a common waiting room. So if you're a specialty lens practice guy, maybe you want to be close to a, a specialty lens practice or a pediatrics practice. Maybe you want to be lo located really close to the schools. So there's, there's a lot to that. And the, and the same goes with your virtuals space. And we are going to touch on that because that's such a hot topic right now. But I bet if I quizzed everybody on the types of optometric practice marketing before this, this webinar, most of you probably would have said internal marketing and external marketing. And most people would raise their hand and say, I'm, I'm pretty good at internal marketing. But what probably why you're on this webinar is, is this whole aspect of external marketing. But I want to flip the script a little bit. And, and really erase those from your mindset because um, AMA kind of has nine major categories of marketing. So I want to highlight those, uh, what people that are professional marketers look at and how they attack marketing from a, from a more MBA perspective for your practice. So we'll start, these are the nine here and we'll start by going through each one, one by one with a nice overview and some practice examples. So most of you know what influencer marketing is. This is where uh, the football quarterback is doing uh, advertisement on TV or my daughter secretly, I watched the Bachelor TV show and um, most people go on that TV show for fame and then they go on social media for influencer marketing and they make a living off this influencer marketing so you're probably thinking what in the hell does that have to do with my practice i don't really know a professional person or whatnot but maybe you do and if you do you should be utilizing that and i know a practice in our area that is the team the team optometrist for the hot local professional hockey team and so they advertise that and, and that's a key influencer marketing that they can use. But what about the average show practice? How can you leverage influencer marketing uh, for your practice? And, um, you know, it's hugely powerful and it's, it's really a tremendous way to catapult your practice. So do you guys want to know how we do it? It's kind of a secret. I don't, I don't know if we should tell them, Ryan. I don't, I don't know. But this, this is the part where some cryptocurrency and cash should be flowing in my bank account. So are you guys ready? So I, I leaked this one out to you earlier. And your online reviews are your number one influencer marketing for your practice. And this is, this is not the opinion of Wu University. This is Chris Smiley's professional opinion. But I watch doctors go on ODs on social media all day long. And, they, and the first every time, there's always a post every day about, Somebody got a negative Google review. And I get frustrated with that because we, we're better than that. It, it's like a missed refraction. You know, it's like a redo on a refraction. We have to look at that differently. It, and what that tells me is, is that person is not managing their influencer marketing at all. Um, most of us have many happy, successful patients and they return year after year after year. Why don't we turn these guys into our ambassadors? And there are third-party software that can do that. That's not exactly how we do it, but it, it took us about six months to nine months to really grasp this. And, and our, our, uh, one of the third parties we use, we have an ability to text message patients a link to leave a Google review. And we ask them, we ask them while they're getting checked out. 
And we don't ask the new patient that's a, a random that we don't know unless that new patient was gloating. But we ask those patients that return year after year, you know, can you help us out? Would you leave us a Google review based on your experience with our practice? And so we let our patients be our influencers for our practice. And this by far is the one of the most powerful words of mouth that you can have. So no longer is Sally telling her best friend about how great Dr. McKinnis was. Now you have Sally telling the whole world how great Dr. McKinnis practice is. And that is powerful. Now, if you wanna take that kind of marketing to the next level, um, what do you do? Let's look at a guy like Tom Arnold. Everybody in the specialty contact lens world knows Tom Arnold. So what makes Tom so great besides the fact that he's an incredible eye doctor? He is an amazing marketer. He videos patient testimonials and puts them on the web. This is what made his specialty contact lens uh, practice so famous. And what can be more influencing than that type of patient, or even maybe a vision therapy patient, if that's your, your brand and your specialty. Um, and this is something our practice is really going to start working on soon because influencer marketing is so, so, so very powerful and should not be overlooked. And that's why I spent a little bit of time on it here with you. So take notes, influencer marketing should be on your to-do list. So relationship marketing, you know, this is really what's going to differentiate the private practice from the retail giants. Um, and people are, oh, Warby Parker's going public and all this other stuff. Um, but what we do so well and what makes our practices so great is that we are masters at this relationship marketing. You know, there are stores that create these loyalty cards and that's, that's relationship marketing. They're trying to tap into some of this relationship marketing through loyalty cards. And there's certainly things that we can do like referral programs and other things like that. And it's really hard to put a finger on all the elements of building a relationship and relationship marketing, because we really all do this very well. And we all know the practices that have the most personable staff that have developed those personal ties with with patients are, are truly some of the most successful. One big area that comes to mind in patient marketing, and uh, we'll, Dr. McKenna and I will say this a lot, we could spend a whole lecture on just this one topic, but is the customer experience. Um, that is the super hot topic in optometry right now. I think you should attend a CE, a webinar. Dr. Wu, maybe you need a webinar on the customer experience here to learn tips and tricks to how to improve the patient experience and you'll elevate your, your uh, relationship marketing in a way the competition cannot. Again, the private practices have a huge advantage in this area. And think about that patient that maybe went somewhere else and they came back. They came back because you are so good at this. So keep doing it. Don't lose focus on it. Um, there's always work to be done in the patient experience. And um, this is, again, what makes us super successful. Just check and see where we're at on time. Looks like we're running pretty good. Uh, so I kind of alluded to that earlier, the patient experience. So we'll skip that and we'll go into viral marketing. So do you guys all remember the ice bucket challenge? Who remembers that? See, this is not a live interactive group. And so I'm waving myself here like an idiot. Um, or I'm a little old and we have Wendy's headquarters here in Columbus, Ohio, but they, they did this great commercial a long time ago called Where's the Beef? I wish they would bring it back because they crush McDonald's. They it was amazing marketing. Or maybe more recently, the Dollar Shave Club. Um, they crushed Gillette uh, with this viral marketing. Um, and, you know, viral marketing's best use in um, national campaigns. Um, you might use some hashtags. Um, and just like influencer marketing, you really just don't need to know somebody famous or have a big national viral campaign to be effective. Um, so it should be on your radar. You just really need a good community-based viral campaign and it can catapult your brand or your messaging in some incredibly impactful ways. Um, TikTok, social media is going to be the primary medium you might use for this, although it could be word of mouth. You know, maybe you create this tagline and slogan and it's you're in a small community where you can make this work. But don't forget about viral marketing. One day, one of you listeners that's super creative is going to come up to me in a meeting and say they did it. They did a viral marketing and I can't wait to hear your story. I'm not creative enough for this kind of viral marketing stuff. So 
I'm always looking for it, but I haven't hit on it. So I'll, I'll tell you right now, in all honesty, I'm not an expert, but there is somebody super creative that can make this work. Guerrilla marketing. Okay, it is exactly what it sounds like. The best part about guerrilla marketing is, is it's usually pretty cheap um, and it's unconventional, it's impactful. So if you've ever seen a big slogan or billboard that has something crazy going on, it just takes your attention away from everything else. That's kind of what guerrilla marketing is. We do have an example here in Columbus, Ohio. There was a private practice that, that was known for having a dinosaur bones, like almost like a anthropology kind of thing in their window. And they, they were a vision therapy focused practice and they decided to separate their pediatric practice into a new facility and keep this facility with the dinosaur as kind of their adult practice. So give me a second here. What they did was, is the big dinosaur disappeared and it just disappeared. And everybody once was walking in, where's the dinosaur? Where's the dinosaur? Where's the dinosaur? And that's how they announced that they're, pediatric practice move. And I even think they did something with baby dinosaurs with this dig. Super creative guerrilla marketing. As far as I was trying to think of a good idea for your practice. So let's say you run a dry eye clinic, maybe in this, in the spirit of Halloween, that's coming not too long uh, ahead here. You might be able to create one of those dummies with the eyes that are all crackly and some signage and say dry eye. And, and you could do something like that in your waiting room. But I think it's gonna revolve around your physical facility um, if your zoning allows. Again, it's kind of off the wall stuff, but man, it's super impactful. Green marketing. Green marketing is exactly how it sounds. So maybe you do a new building and you get these lead uh, ratings or I know there's a contact lens companies have kind of embraced green marketing around recycling for their contact lenses, um, especially with our younger patients that now have indispensable income, green marketing is highly powerful. So leverage that in your practice um, as much as you can. It's just not something to be forgotten about. It's super powerful. So content marketing. Um, one of the things, and, and Dr. McKinnis talked about this a bit ago, about he tells a story. Um, Dr. McKinnis is quietly a master of content marketing um, because that is what differentiates his message from just another email, just another, uh, just more spam. When we, we're, we're in this digital era, we're getting hit with so many messages. What's going to make your story stand out? And that is telling your story um, and stepping it up to the next level where you, you should put it on video. So I would like to see Dr. McKinnis have his story on video on his website. I think it would be hugely powerful um, for him getting new patients. But content truly is that. It's about content, 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 keeping it interesting. It's what makes your practice unique. And it's what's going to drive that customer that has that particular need to your practice. So maybe you create a website blog and you add content once or twice a month about a various topic. Um, but again, there, there's a lot that you can think of here. And we'll go a little more into how content drives your web presence. Uh, but content is an important element of optometric practice marketing. So marketers kind of divide things instead of, you know, how we look at things as internal and external marketing. Big time marketers look at things differently. It's, they're looking at more inbound and outbound marketing. And inbound marketing is the favored marketing approach of marketers today. Um, basically what it does is puts the shopper already out there looking for a particular need and connects them to your practice. So an inbound marketing builds a bridge to your practice. So think of it this way. Let's say you're going fishing, right? Well, inbound marketing, you're tactful. So you have your depth finder and you find the fish. But you don't put the rod in the water. The fish jump in the boat. Um, that's what inbound marketing does. And this is where we want to focus a lot of efforts, especially our external marketing with an optometric practice, because we want those patients to jump into our practice, right? So you're like, well, how do we do that? That's what I want to do. Um, that's why you're all here, right? Um, there's, there's no silver bullet. 
there's just simple things that you can do. For example, let's say a patient is on their insurance website looking for an eye doctor. Um, is your listing up to date? Meaning, you know, do you have all your bio, all your info, all your links on there? Can your patients directly schedule to your practice online from there um, with an active online scheduler link? Because if your listing's not up to date, they're going to select someone else. That patient is already there. You just got to help them jump in the boat. You know, you got to create that bridge. Um, this is also going to circle back to your website um, or Google reviews. If someone is looking at a service you provide, are they going to be able to find you on your web via the virtual world? Let's see. Another thing you could do is, is let's say you're a primary care practice. You could, this doesn't have to be, inbound marketing can be both internal or external. So let's say you have a real nice primary care practice and you wanna add a dry eye clinic. Well, start to create the protocols, the communications and all the, the techniques that patient is already there. You just have to identify the need uh, for that patient. So you could build a dry eye practice out of just a regular primary care practice. And that would be a form of inbound marketing as well. Again, I wish we could go over inbound marketing a, a lot deeper, but I would 100% focus all my external marketing efforts, especially on this inbound marketing. Um, it, it's really going to where your best bang for the buck is. Outbound marketing, you know, this is what we would think of as advertising. It's the generally the least effective and most costly marketing campaign we could do. Um, if you're overspending on outbound marketing, because that's what you've always done in the past and getting result less than satisfactory, I would immediately encourage you to redirect your marketing dollars towards some inbound marketing. You know, there are a lot of things you could do like donating to the school sports team. Uh, and you get a nice banner for marketing. But I would think of that more as a charity for a good cause and some brand awareness, not as an effective outbound marketing. But there are some exceptions or some small towns where that really can, can make a difference. I remember early in my days, a consulting group did this big marketing analysis for me. Uh, this is probably back in the early 2000s. And they told me that a radio campaign was my most effective external marketing. Um, strategy. The only problem is I did have a two location practice, which is an advantage. But the problem was, is I'd be paying for a marketing campaign to the whole central Ohio metro area. And my practices really only encompass 5% of that geography. So fortunately for me, I did not do that marketing campaign. Um, but maybe that was the best of the external marketing, which tells you that outbound marketing is tough uh, for a private practice. Now we'll get into the fun stuff because this is probably what uh, most people are interested in is the, the World Wide Web. And, and so earlier in the slide, we had all the, the changes from phone book to everything and World Wide Web's where it's at. And keyword marketing is just exactly how it sounds. So let's say a patient received a diagnosis of keratoconus and they Googled it. Maybe Google probably spell corrected it for them. Um, and the patient might be searching some things about the disease. And lo and behold, they find your website because you've placed great keywords on keratoconus. And from there, you have great content marketing that tells a good story. And the patient becomes educated about how you treat this with scleral lenses. And then they've now become a patient uh, of your practice. And, that, and that's kind of how this works. So here in a second, we'll talk about search engine optimization. And what search engine optimization is, is how do you get to number one? It is achieving top results for each keyword. And the challenge here sometimes is, is sometimes we're too technical and we can't think of maybe what the patient might want to be searching for. And that's where some professional web marketers can really help you out and identify what do patients really search for. The number one mistake that almost every eye doctor makes in the search engine and optimization is, and, and you'll see it, you'll go to opt optometry meeting and docs will go to the, the booths or they'll have 
uh, internet company booths and they'll be coming at you, coming at you. Hey, what well, are you top? And then you'll Google, they'll Google eye exam doctor in this one area. And that's a huge mistake. I mean, if you are number one in eye exam and eye doctor for your area, fantastic. But I'm in a large major metro area and that is tough. I mean, it's really tough to do. It's, so, you know, I, I get a little weary about that. The question is, and hopefully I get this right here, you know, do you want to be a small fish in a big ocean or do you want to be a big fish in a small pond? And when it comes to search engine optimization, you want to be a big fish in a small pond. So that's where an effective SEO strategy will do the latter for you by focusing more on those things that make your brand unique. And, and having some professional help here can be very, very, very beneficial in identifying what those are. Because I'll tell you, I struggled and I struggled for years with this. Um, and, and finally, just like doing tax returns, you know, I wouldn't file my own tax return it's for my practice. There's just no way I would do that. And so I think search engine optimization is so complicated that I'd highly recommend you seek professional help when it comes to this, if you want to do it good. Now, granted, there are smaller practices. And when you're starting practice, you don't have big budgets to do that. And that's understandable. So, so we may have to take a DIY approach at first just to get started. Um, but as momentum builds, momentum builds, you have to start looking at where do I want to spend my time and what do I want to outsource and what do I want to do in-house? Yeah, and Chris, I would throw in there, we're, we're in the small budget area ourselves being, you know, eight plus months into this. So if you want to do SEO um, on, on a budget, I would say the most important thing you can do is actively update your website. I mean, in a nutshell, that's what SEO is. It, there's just a lot more to it and there's a lot of nuances that they get into. But uh, my wife is on me monthly to write a different blog, post a different video, find something else to throw on the website because that does matter to these search engines when they send their crawlers out to index your site. So even if you just start with that, you'll be ahead of 75% oh, yeah, of yeah. the other docs in the game, just if you update your website on a somewhat regular basis. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. And I would put it on my calendar. I would specifically a lot, one or two hours uh, every couple of weeks to create that content and just make it a priority. This is my, my business time because it is so, so important. Um, Pay-per-click advertising, that's exactly what it says. You're going to pay for the keyword, basically, that you want to pop up, and then Google will have you rank high in that ad category. Um, and it's a way to cheat the system. That's where being that big fish in a small pond, you may not have to pay as much for very niche things. But if you want to be the top eye doctor or top eye exam in a major metropolitan area, that's going to get pretty costly to do that. And you may or may not see the return on investment with that. So then I'll turn it over back to you. Uh, I kind of showed my hand of, of my feelings about uh, some web marketing, but I, I think, well, I'll let you take over there, Dr. McKinnis. Yeah. So, I mean, when the rubber meets the road, how do we manage our marketing? And as, as most things, there's pros and cons to both. Um, if you're going to outsource it, the beauty of it is that you can focus your time on other aspects of it, uh, other aspects in your practice. Um, if you're managing a multi-location practice and you've got 45 employees and seven doctors and you're trying to manage that, chances are you, you really don't want to sit down and record a video uh, about myopia management, put it on the website uh, yourself. There's a pretty good chance that you're going to want someone else handling those things. And so outsourcing does free up the time and it allows experts to, to act like experts. Uh, I can fix the garbage disposal, but I'm not going to plumb my entire house. It's not where my skills are. And so we let plumbers do plumber things, electricians do electrical things, and we let these marketing folks do what they know how to do. Uh, the downside I've run into when we look at outsourcing, and there's really only one downside, maybe two, but the big one is it's really expensive and you can, you can run up a bill pretty quick on this type of stuff. So, uh, 
it's the old get three, four, five quotes and, and try and figure out who's going to give you the most bang for your buck. Um, the other thing is if you have uh, somebody who has never visited your practice and really doesn't understand the vibe and, and the mission of your practice, the marketing can sort of diverge from the practice's mission and experience pretty significantly and you got to reel them back in. So that would be another con uh, to look out for. In-house is largely the opposite of that. Uh, right now we handle most of our marketing in-house because we're small and, and we can. And the pros to that is that is that it's a very tight mission and, and, and uh, budget friendly uh, marketing drive that we have. And the downside is that there will come a day where we can't do it. I mean, as we grow and, and as we uh, hopefully become more successful, um, we're going to have to be robbing Peter to pay Paul if we want to keep up with the type of marketing that we're doing. And so you do find yourself uh, you know, more embedded in marketing things than perhaps clinical aspects that you wish you could spend more time on. So uh, just food for thought there on whether you want to outsource it uh, or whether you want to do most of it in-house. And my recommendation would be, there's a lot of routes you can go, but I would, the challenge I ran into with marketing and this, is there's some things that you just have to do in house. So there's certain, some of those touchy feely things, that relationship marketing that, that has, you have to work on that patient experience. No one else can do that for you. Right. When it comes to our web, um, one of the challenges you'll have if you do outsources is does your company you outsource to know optometry? Do they know what keratoconus is? Do they know what dry eye is? Do they know all these things? You really need a partner who knows how to do that um, and knows those things and, and they're hard to find. So um, I like a combination approach. Um, that way you can have your hand in the, what you're good at and then you can outsource what you're not good at. Uh, but even if you outsource, uh, one of the the big tips I, I could make is maybe we don't have to be the video editors, but I think video content is going to be such a huge play for the future. Uh, we're going to have to be capturing those videos and then turn that off to a professional. So again, kind of a combination approach. So I wish I, I took a basic photography in high school, but I wish I had <laughs> more professional video, videotography. Even my lighting here is not great. So um, we could do better in that. Right. And this is just an example of, of a marketing calendar. It does not have to be um, this robust. This person obviously needs therapy for their, um, <laughs> because they've color coded every last aspect of their lives. And so that that's for another lecture uh, that we'll use <laughs> on, I'm sure. But uh, nevertheless, mark it down on your calendar. Yes, you know, I mean, this, I, I, I kid you not, my, my wife is on me every month. First of the month comes up, she goes, where's your blog? And usually by the eighth of the month, I've actually written the blog then. So uh, it doesn't have to be anything huge. 300 words will we'll do it. People don't want to read more than that anyway. Uh, if you're doing videos, keep it short and sweet. 90 seconds or less, that's the attention span you're going to get on these type of things. And uh, you want it to be informative, but you also want it to be entertaining. And so if, it's, if that's not you, find somebody in the practice that it is, and, and we go with that. But we, we have to make it a habit of ours. Uh, we didn't become good at fitting contact lenses or doing vision therapy. Uh, surgeons didn't become good surgeons by doing it three times and saying, okay, I don't have to work at this anymore. Like anything else, it has to become a repeatable uh, exercise. And then next thing you know, uh, you discover some things. And we really just focus on themes for seasons. So right now, a lot of you should be starting to kind of come to some tail ends. You're back to school. Some of the kids are back to school having some problems. So that should start to be winding down in the next month or so. And now focus on more year end type things uh, with people's flex spending and getting their insurance benefit used would be key things right now. Right. So uh, I saw some questions come through about uh, how do we know what's working and what's not working? And isn't that the million dollar question? <laughs> it's like a lot of times we don't know what we don't know. Um, but the definition of insanity, of course, is we heard all the time is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Um, if you find that marketing is not working the way you wish it, it were, it's rarely a single reason why. Um, 
some of the reasons you might find is did the office stray from its core message or did the marketing not properly convey the message that you wish it did? Uh, what I find more often is the marketing works in getting people in there, but the experience in the office may not have lived up to the expectations that the marketing set. Sometimes it's the staff, sometimes it's the doctor. And uh, we're all human and we have bad days, we have good days and uh, these things happen. But I, I do think you have to step back and take a 30,000 foot view sometimes as to what you're trying to promote and, and, and really what you're trying to accomplish here. Uh, when we set up our practice, it's in an old dry cleaner space. And one of the things I, I really was insistent on is that I didn't want it to look and feel like every other eye doctor's office that I'd ever been in, including some of the ones I've worked in. So we kept the 25 foot ceilings with the exposed exhaust uh, above us there. And we only put the drop ceilings in back for HIPAA purposes in the patient rooms. And we, we use some fairly bold colors and we've got a sliding glass door in the front with big, large windows that, yes, I lie awake at night worrying about someone's gonna throw a rock through them and steal all my frames. But you know, these are the type of things we do because it's the image we wanted to convey and we want it to, when the patient walks in and taken aback that this isn't every this isn't the regular eye doctor I've been to, and then we want the experience to be so good that they're like, no, this really isn't the every other eye doctor I've been to. So that's been our message for the first eight months, and thankfully it, it, it's worked. Um, but the challenge is then, as you grow, can you keep up with that message? How do you continually hire and train and bring people in there? Um, it, it's it's like Chick-fil-A. You got to find the people who say it's my pleasure and act like they've worked at Chick-fil-A their entire lives. And that's what you have to do in your practices. And that's where the real challenge comes when you're trying to deliver on the marketing that, that you put out there. Yeah. And it, yeah, I, I love that. I love what you've done with your practice. That's fantastic. I can't tell you how many times I see a doctor, oh, I'm a high tech practice and they're, they're in a dump. I mean, the, the <laughs> dark dump. I see Dr. Wu coming on. We have one last slide, Dr. Wu, and then we're, uh, we'll wrap up here. So um, I, I think back to how do you know your marketing's working? Well, ask your patients. When you get new patients coming in, ask them, how did you find out about our practice? And if what you're doing marketing isn't attracting people to your practice, it's probably not working. Um, patients should be able to say. So we'll, if we do we have time, Dr. Wu, for a wrap up on this quick Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Dr. McKinnis, you want to go first? We want, I, I think the crowd might be interested in knowing, you know, what we've done well and what we've done poorly. Um, yeah. I mean, once again, fairly new, but what we've done well is with online scheduling and getting in front of folks on the web. Google reviews have been excellent. So that has been probably the, what we've done the best. Uh, the biggest blunder I would say we've made so far is thinking that dollars spent guarantees dollars returned. <laughs> um, it, it's easy just to start writing checks and think, well, because it's expensive, it must be effective. And that's not always the case. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my biggest marketing win was when I did decide to outsource my, my web presence. I, I had such a big practice and they were able to hit my SEO just perfectly. Um, they coached my team on how to get Google reviews because before we would get that one negative Google review and be that guy that would go on ODs on social media and want to complain. So they, they've really got our practice really in tune and work with us with the monthly phone call. My biggest blunder was, is I always go to the movie theater and before the movies start, although I don't think we've been to movie theaters in a couple of years because this COVID stuff, we'd always see that screen. And so one of the early things I did was this would qualify as outbound marketing where you basically put a billboard movie screen. I think I spent $1,500 a month and I had a two-year contract on that. And I had a couple of existing patients say, I saw you at the movies. I had zero patients say they saw me from that. So <laughs> Yeah. Last question, uh, Dr. McKinnis, you know, where do you think an OD should put their the most resources for best results? Uh, it's cliche, but the people in front of you and Google reviews. I mean, every new patient that came into the area when we asked them and we asked them why they come in, which is important. This is part of the data gathering. 99% of them say, I looked up the five doctors in my area that are on my insurance and I picked the one that had the most or the highest Google rating. 
And so, I mean, it's remarkable, but it's, it's really that simple for a lot of these folks. So the audience has heard us say Google reviews like five or six times. I think you should make note of that, that your Google managing your Google reviews is by far one of the best word of mouth free marketing things that you could ever have. So, um, and I would just reiterate that any, any internal marketing that we've done with patients and things, I, I think really getting that search engine optimization and adding content to our website, the whole online package is really help our external marketing. Cause like I said, most ODs do the internal stuff pretty well. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Wu here.